Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the 360 OS Forum. I'm Graham Brookie with the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab, and we are so glad uh, to start the second day of programming. Uh, yesterday, just to recap, we had a garden variety of digital forensic research and op open source uh, topics to include armed conflict verification and geolocation, uh, corruption and investigative journalism. What we're here to talk about today is fake news and connectivity. Uh, so I'm very excited to start this first session uh, called WTF, What the Fact? Uh, and joining us, we will have Eugene Cho Lee, President of the Ukrainian World Congress, uh, Ann Applebaum, columnist with the Washington Post, Svetlana Zalishchuk, member of the Ukrainian Parliament, moderated by Natasha Bertrand, senior reporter with Business Insider. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this. Um, I thought that we could start out with fairly broad questions just about the nature of Russia's disinformation and fake news campaign in Ukraine and how Russia's kind of employed this hybrid, hybrid warfare um, in Ukraine and just kind of talk about what lessons um, you all have learned from that and how you think that they can be, they can and should be extended to um, the U.S. And, and the rest of Europe. I mean, I know that having reported on the campaign last year, um, it became very clear to us that we were all just woefully unprepared for um, the, the Russian disinformation and, and fake news campaign that really flooded um, the election throughout the latter months. Um, so just kind of hearing from you all about um, your experience and, and what you think can be taken away from that. Um, anyone who wants to jump in. But let me start then. Uh, I think that the, um, essentially what we've seen on the ground is, is that Russian disinformation is part, regarding U Ukraine, part of uh, the hybrid war that uh, Russia has waged against Ukraine, which includes not only the illegal uh, occupation of Crimea, uh, the uh, military aggression in eastern Ukraine, uh, but also includes cyber attacks it includes a massive disinformation campaign to destabilize and to eventually reconquer Ukraine. I think that if one looks at it from that perspective, one understands that disinformation is a superbly dangerous, uh, uh, well-oiled, uh, very well-financed uh, weapon that is being used uh, in order to reconquer Ukraine. And for all of those who thought that this was limited to Ukraine or limited to Eastern uh, European countries, uh, got a wake-up call with the uh, Russian intervention in various uh, elections, uh, be it in Europe or the United States, uh, where, where we're seeing that uh, it is a global uh, problem and a global issue that needs to be addressed as such. Uh, I think you said something very important, though, which is that you need to look at disinformation as part of a larger process. So <clears throat> it's not just, you know, the stuff in the newspaper or the stuff online that's, that's not true, that's the problem. It's that it's usually part of a, a larger set of, um, you know, a larger set of attempts to manipulate a political system. And these include um, straight out funding for political parties um, in the West, in, in Europe, uh, anti-democratic political parties, not necessarily pro-Russian ones. Um, these include the use of businessmen, it's not, which is not always illegal, but the, the sort of selective investment into big companies and the attempt to get particular business interests um, on Russia's side, um, as well as the use of false information and, um, and other kinds of uh, techniques of manipulating the news, um, the news cycle. So it, it, it helps a lot, I think, when you're reporting on something like this to understand that those, all those three, um, you know, those three techniques are being used at once because they often interact with Correct. one another. So, you know, I don't know, the, the, the businessman who's had a big investment from Russia, I mean, for example, 
Donald Trump was an example of this, you know, can be relied upon to repeat Russian disinformation or the political party that doesn't have any obvious links to Russia but is secretly funded by Russia can also be relied upon to push Russian disinformation. So these things interact with one another as a whole, and if you're reporting on it, it's important to know about all of them, I think. I would like to continue. I think it's George Orwell who said that freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follow. It seems to me that it's time to understand that with dealing with Russia disinformation and propaganda, two plus two is not granted anymore. But I looked up on the Wikipedia of what disinformation is, and it's like fake news used deliberately to distort the information. But we have to be very careful with the definitions, really, and understand what we are dealing with. Because in this information, it's not about information, it's not about journalism, it's not about media, it's about global decision making, it's about elections, it's about resources, it's about power. Look at the victims of the Russian disinformation. First of all, it's global decision-making, as I've said, and elections, it's not anymore a sovereign exercise. Third countries, third parties can participate in our elections. Boards can basically elect our presidents and our representatives in the parliament. Uh, then international relationship, they also suffer from the influence of the fake news around the world, and Ukraine is a very bright victim. I can tell you one concrete story. Uh, we are here in Poland, Poland and Ukraine recently. Uh, I think our international re our relations are getting more difficult because of the historical background. There were difficult, you know, pages in our history, but now some NGOs working here in Warsaw are financed by Russian by Gazprom in order to instigate those painful uh, pages between Ukrainian and Poland history. Uh, and uh, I think we have to understand, uh, I brought some slides, it's impossible to show them, but I'll, I, I'll try to describe. Uh, if we look at the challenges of the 20th and 21st uh, first century, it was WW1 and then WW2, but now I think it's WWW. And, uh, you know, uh, we have to put it uh, on the agenda and understand that this information is something that is basically undermining uh, the whole of our capacity of, uh, f of moving forward uh, our, democratic, uh, our democracies. So, coming off of that, how would you begin to combat the kind of exhaust, exa political exhaustion and civic apathy that may actually help the Russians um, further their propaganda campaign? So, for example, people who share fake news stories on Facebook because it echoes their worldview and because it reinforces their perceptions, and they don't really care whether it's real or not. Um, this is something that they share kind of mindlessly. Um, how, would you, how would you kind of begin to, to emphasize to people and rebuild trust in the media? So far, there are really three main avenues that people have been looking at in order to figure out what to do about this phenomenon. Um, and you know, forgive me if there are those of you in this room who've already thought all this through. Um, you alluded to one of them, which is to do with fact-checking. Um, we know what the problems with fact-checking are. The problem with fact-checking is that you can create very good, even excellent, um, neutral fact-checking websites, but then how do you get people to read them? So how do you reach an alienated audience which isn't interested in facts and which, as you say, is interested in seeing its views um, repeated uh, on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere else? Um, uh, there are a lot of efforts right now to try and, um, in a way, customize fact-checking so that you, you customize it so that it reaches particular audiences. Um, I'm working on a project now um, out of the London School of Economics which will measure different kinds of audience reactions to different kinds of articles. So perhaps if you can use facts, you know, generally speaking, people resist facts when they're presented on a plate, you know, just you know, numbers or, or corrections. Um, but it's possible that if you present them in the form of a narrative or if you can accompany them with pictures. I mean, there may be other ways in which to present them. So people are now working on looking at how to make fact-checking better, how to make it more appropriate for particular audiences. Um, and that's, I know of several projects that are 
that are that are looking at that right now. So that's kind of one avenue that's being used. Um, a second ad of avenue is media literacy campaigns, um, which is a boring way of saying, you know, helping people get used to this idea that there's lots of fake stuff on the internet and teaching them how to distinguish reality from fakes. And of course, many of the first efforts to do this were pretty primitive. Um, but once again, if you, can, if you can begin thinking of media literacy perhaps as a form of entertainment, can you imagine a reality television program about information war, for example, um, somebody who's caught by a fake story? I mean, you can begin to educate people either through that or, for example, chains of um, you know, clips on the internet that make fun of some satire is very useful in media, in media literacy. I mean, people are beginning to look at more creative and more interesting ways of doing that so that it's not just, I don't know, a course in school or a, some kind of education at a university. Um, although, of course, it may be that in the, in the, in the long term, those are important too. Um, the, third, the third thing that people are looking at is um, s something like what this meeting is, which is ways to reinforce independent journalism, um, helping independent journalists survive financially. Um, you know, for example, in, in Poland, this is going to become a really big issue because um, the government has pu is putting pressure on companies not to advertise in independent newspapers and on independent television. So you have a situation where people's actual the financial and economic survival is threatened by a government which doesn't like the free press and which doesn't like criticism. So in, are there international funds that can help that? Are there different ways, more innovative ways of raising money? So that's a piece of making sure that independent journalism is financially viable is really important, but also making sure that it continues to innovate um, and that it continues to reach people in new ways, um, that it uses the new tools of the internet and that it doesn't slip into, you know, for lack of money in particular, that it doesn't slip into boring or repetitive or sensationalist um, news. I mean, I mean, in a way, one of the biggest problems in the U.S. election campaign wasn't just the you know, Russian hacking of Hillary Clinton's campaign, it was the massive sensational reporting of really what were incredibly banal emails mm -hmm. and turning them into crazy stories. Um, and some of that was done deliberately and some of that was done by sensationalist media, which was looking to make money. So finding ways to support good media and helping good media think about care, you know, ways to, to exist, you know, that's another piece of the story. I would say right now, those are the most important three areas of both research and innovation that people are working on. I would completely agree, and I would like to add probably one more uh, direction to what uh, Anne has said. Um, I mean, you know, let's presume uh, that P Putin, uh, Russian president, uh, ordered directly, personally, of uh, to you know to undermine American elections, but when when we think, do we have actually instruments to punish him for that? To punish the act of the interfering into someone's election? I I, I doubt that, and it just struck me that uh, on in the time when um, you know when uh, uh, you know uh, they are. Um, uh, they are able to undermine something so precious to us as, uh, uh, as elections and uh, democratic process. We don't have institutions, we don't have conventions, we don't have treaties when we are able to prosecute that properly on the global level. So what I'm trying to say is we have to put it on the agenda of a, uh, global uh, politics, because in fact, today it is about Russia and today it is about Putin. But tomorrow, I think, why wouldn't China, who is much more visible on the, uh, in geopolitics today, why wouldn't ISIS, why wouldn't other countries that are, would like to also interfere and to use those examples that are there already to interfere into some, someone's uh, democratic processes, wouldn't use this hybrid warfare and uh, it, that means that we have to elaborate on the international level those political instruments and legal framework uh, to make sure that those who are responsible for that will be punished. I think it's also important to understand that in order to uh, counter uh, disinformation, uh, one cannot just try to undo every single fake story. 
one needs in order to expose it correctly, to explain the narrative behind it. One needs to explain what is it that the Russian Federation is attempting to do in order to attain its goal. Why is it spending so much time, effort, and money in order to disinform the world? So in the case of Ukraine, for instance, one needs to present it and, and to explain that it is essentially meant to discredit Ukraine, to convince the international community that Ukraine is a failed state, to discourage investments into Ukraine, and to ensure that Ukraine eventually has no other alternative but to, 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 to uh, turn back to the Soviet Union or to a, a, a new a revamped Soviet Union. And I think it's also important to understand the means uh, that, that, are, that are used. It's not necessarily uh, fake, uh, fake news is not necessarily meant to, on each story to convince you of, of a different uh, approach or a different uh, uh, idea of what, of what transpired. I watched a documentary in Canada on uh, MH17 where they were portraying how every second or third month the Russian Federation came with a new story of what happened. And I looked at it and I figured, after four or five of those stories, what credibility do they still have? And at the end, they were interviewing the families of the victims. And to my dismay, I, people were answering the following two questions. Do you believe the Russian story? The answer was no. And then they said, do you believe the Ukrainian version? They say, we don't believe anybody. Yeah, I saw, I saw a couple of interviews that were done right after MH17, cra the crash. Uh, by Radio for Europe in Moscow, and they were interviewing people on the street. Yeah. And, the, and there was a, one in particular struck me where they asked a woman, you know, what happened? She said, I don't know what happened, and we'll never know. Exactly. It won't be possible to find out. And that was the effect of this multiple, um, multiple, um, uh, you know, different explanations, some crazy, you know, th that, that the Russians put out. Exactly. And that is the ultimate goal, which is to just sow confusion and chaos and just kind of undermine all yeah, trust. Yeah, and, it, and it's important and to understand that that's, um, you know, it's not just the Russians doing that. That's, that's somewhat of the effect of the Internet today. I mean, you mm -hmm. still, you know, if you, if you roam around looking for stories about anything, you can find so many contradictory explanations. Um, one of the effects of it is for people to say, oh, I just, you know, I don't want to know anymore. It's too complicated and it's you know, too, too boring and I can't, you know, I can't figure it out. Um, but that once again leads me to return to this question of independent news mm -hmm. and how we can rebuild trust in independent news organizations or in other kinds of organizations that seek to, um, you know, that seek to portray, you know, portray reality as it is or as close as possible to how it is. Um, and we need to rethink how that can be done. And that's of course the job of people in this room. I would like to continue from that. Uh, Yes, it's one thing when people are just very confused and uh, can't, uh, can't differentiate where is truth, where is false, where is fake. Uh, but the, other, the, the next stage is when people being confused are getting into some actions which are really can be dangerous. For example, I'd like to remind you of a story in Germany about Lisa girl. Mm -hmm. Probably mm -hmm. everyone knows it, right? You remember that there was a story reported that Russian girl was raped and uh, police was reluctant to deal with it. And then what people did, they, it was not people who were brought there by Putin, by Moscow to Berlin, you know, to Berlin streets, but people went into the protests against German police uh, because they believed, really, that police didn't do uh, e enough. It means that fake news and disinformation is able to undermine people's trust into democratic institutions in the country which is thousands mi miles away from the center where these fake news are being born. So I'm trying to say that uh, it's, uh, you know, the next stage of the disinformation is not just uh, lack of, uh, of confidence of what is white, what is black, but it's an ability with disinformation and propaganda, you can basically, without e even military forces, Without uh, uh, real arms, you can control the processes around the world. And that actually, that leads perfectly into my next question, which is the Russians, you know, at a certain point, they kind of, they put all this out there and they rely a lot on people believing it or people acting on it. But then there's a point where populist leaders kind of step in 
and they take advantage of the fact that all of this is kind of out there and, and that people are acting on it. Um, so I, I guess my next question is that, you know, it's been argued that all Russia really needs to do at this point is just sit back and, and let the populace do its bidding. I mean, political figures who are willing to go along with Russia's agenda because it's, you know, anti-European or anti-globalist. Um, so what role do you think that plays in all of this and, and how much of a danger do you think that is? Well, I think that kind of ties in with what, with what, what I was saying about uh, the situation in Ukraine. One needs to understand uh, because Russian uh, disinformation is very strategic and it's tailor-made. So in order to address it, one needs to understand for a particular country or for a, for a region uh, w what is meant to achieve. And in order to uh, address it effectively, uh, once you understand the purpose of, of that disinformation, for instance, uh, regarding the European Union, to disintegrate the European Union, to create dissension between, uh, between the various European states, you, you can then uh, devise a strategy, a common strategy, in order to counter it. Without that understanding, uh, one, one starts, shoot, like they say, shooting from the hip and, and, and could, could be targeting uh, a, a story or an issue that is very irrelevant. As you have been saying, uh, the attention span of most people who read news today is very short. So if you cannot effectively address the core of the problem, you're, you're going to miss it every time. I completely agree. I think the quick question is not what and not how, but really why. And then if you answer that question of why, it's really, it's really clear of why Russia is meddling in Ukraine and then Georgia and then US and then France and with Merkel and so on. Because uh, Russia doesn't like the global order. They, uh, they, they don't like of that Ukraine was able to uh, overcome this post-Soviet gravity, was able to make this uh, strategic choice uh, on European integration and Euro-Atlantic integration. Putin did understand that these democratic processes are coming so close to his border that one day, and unlike Yanukovych, our former president, he doesn't have anywhere to escape. It will come to his country. And if it comes to his country, one day he will find himself under the, on the bench of the International Criminal Fund, uh, Court. And then it's a real personal threat. That's why he's doing everything possible to undermine this uh, yeah. European <coughs> yeah, integration I I and that development. I agree. Um, one of the things that I think journalists can usefully do, usefully do is expose the, um, the domestic politics of Russia and explain why this is relevant to that. Um, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, when Putin saw young Ukrainians in the street um, organizing what was essentially an anti-corruption demonstration in 2014, because that's really what it was, um, and waving EU flags, um, <coughs> you know, he, he looked at it and he thought, right, that's my personal worst nightmare. Mm. Um, <coughs> it's important to underline that, of course, an anti-corruption and pro-European movement in Russia would be good for Russia and it would be good for Russians, but it would be very bad for the kleptocratic regime in Moscow. And so, you know, he saw that as a kind of personal attack on him and that's why he continued to blame, I don't know, Hillary Clinton and whoever else whom he thought was... Was, was organizing it. Um, but th you know, the more we can do to expl explain why this is important to Putin, because it's not just some, it's not like he's some random bad guy you know, doing things you know, because he's unpleasant. This is all about his personal political survival. You know, he has decided that his personal political survival depends on undermining the EU, undermining not just democracy, but the democracy narrative, which, you know, which moved people in Ukraine and which could theoretically, at some point in the future, move people in Russia. And that's why he's doing this. And so explaining that you know, really over and over and over again, you know, telling people why this is happening, um, that it's not illogical and it's not just a conspiracy theory and it's not just some crazy behavior, I think is also a really important thing for journalists to do. Right, right. The educational component of it is, is really important. Um, so in terms of then responding to Russia's you know, destabilizing activities all across Europe and, and now in the U.S. 
what do you think the appropriate response would be? I mean, I know we, we in the U.S. are considering sanctions. Um, Obama kicked out Russian diplomats from... from understand that it's state-sponsored, and one needs to understand that this is not just fake news. It's not just yeah. disinforming somebody. It is a tool a that, that is a dangerous tool that is part of a whole set of tools in order to gain uh, a, a, and to conquer territories and to, uh, to pursue an imperialist ambition. I would like to pick up from Anne's Macron example. And I think it's very good example because what we really need is a strategic leadership. And for many of you who think that it's just blah, 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 I will give you an example of why it's not just blah, blah, blah. Because uh, you can, uh, Eugene is right. It's about uh, state terrorism is what is so uh, dangerous. And let's ask ourselves, why Putin is able to do what he does? Because he has money. Where does this money come from? From gas. Who is paying money? Europeans. And let me uh, just inform you that uh, here, Poland and Germany and Austria and Italy and other countries, there is a, now one of the decisions is being uh, made in the process about Nord Stream 2. It's a new pipeline that Russia is going to build deterring Ukraine. If they succeed, they will basically destroy the whole energy security system in this region, in eastern and central part of, of the region. And if they succeed, it's it's basically Germany and other European citizens which will pop, pipe Gazprom with money that later on will participate in our elections, will, uh, will pay for the fake news, and so on and so forth. But at the moment, Germany is not blocking this decision. However, it violates so-called third energy package. Why? Because uh, there are a lot of business companies that are beneficiaries of that project. But strategic leadership, this is what we need. We need to see through it. We need to understand that later on this energy energy project will be one of the uh, biggest conditions or one of the biggest, you know, help aid for Putin to realize his Madeline. One another example, it's a historic example, um, 2008, it was a Bucharest NATO summit and Georgia and Ukraine could have been given so-called membership action plan to NATO. And I know that history doesn't know a conditional mood. But if we were given that action plan, and it was France and Germany who blocked it, why? Because they didn't want to irritate Russia. And instead of the irritation, we received full-fledged two hot wars, first in Georgia and then in Ukraine. So if there was a strategic decision in 2008, maybe, who knows, we wouldn't have this Madeline, what we have now, and they would not able to cross the red line of the sovereignty and territorial integrity in our region. Yeah, it's, I was going to say it's also very important when talking about exposing narratives. I think you, you made this reference to understand that the Russian narrative is customized to each country. Um, one of the really great examples and very, you know, confusing ones, for example, is Poland, where, you know, what it, what's in Russia's interest in Poland? Well, in Russia's interest is that Poland be seen as, be isolated, be seen as a kind of crazy far-right country, that it, um, that, it, that it fight with Ukraine over these historical issues, um, that it be separate and distant from Germany, um, that it cease to be influential inside the European Union. And the Russian, um, both online and, and through their actions, for example, through their um, refusal to give back the Smolensk wreckage and sort of encouraging the conspiratorial narratives, um, one of the things they've done is, you know, encouraged subtly um, a, the election of a, and, the, and the staying in power of a Polish government, which is very, very anti-Russian. So confusingly, you know, they want, you know, an anti-Russian government is in their interests. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be true in other countries as well. So that's a, you know, it's almost kind of opposite from what you would think. You know, it's important to understand that Russian propaganda is not necessarily pro-Russian. You know, yeah. they don't really care what we think of them or whether we like them or whether people say nice things about them behind their backs. They're not interested. Um, what they're interested in is, you know, breaking up Europe, um, suppressing those voices that would be, that, you know, th those countries and, and sort of marginalizing the countries that best understand Russia um, and uh, weakening NATO and persuading the United States to stay away. <laughs>
think that's the perfect time to open it up to questions. Um, if anyone has anything to ask. Um, I, I am an American journalist in Berlin, and I have covered we the Soviet Union, well. Ukraine, <laughs> Poland, uh, and Germany. And I, this is not a question. I just want to say thank you for saying these things. I, they are so misunderstood, and it's absolutely essential for all of the reasons that you've given. And, and I, I just want to thank the organizers of, of this uh, open source for taking this up to this level. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Disturbing to be in the round like this. <laughs> I know, it's like literally Can't 360. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm a, uh, a consultant out of uh, Texas. And um, I, it, listening to you, you know, you had kind of listed three sort of solutions that we're um, talking about. But one thing I didn't hear that I'm curious to um, understand your opinions about is the technological solutions, things like, um, you know, when we talk about disinformation, we talk a lot about the fake news piece. We don't, um, and partially I think because people don't understand it as well, we don't talk as much about the bots and we don't talk as much about those technological amplifiers that we're dealing with, um, particularly that we saw during the elections where you can see these spikes in activity, right, with the, um, with the botnets. And um, I think most people in the room know that this predated the election even in the US, right, that we saw this with some, um, some other things like the Columbia Chemicals um, particular issue and, and some others. Um, but what, um, you know, have you heard people talk about sort of um, solutions like good bots, you know, um, bots that would fight back against that type of thing, um, sort of fighting fire with fire, if you will. Um, I just wonder how much is going on in the tech sphere about that and if you guys have any thoughts on that. So, so I, I, can t I have been talking to lots of the tech companies about some of, this, um, some of these subjects. Um, I think it's fair to say that most of them were not interested in this issue until very recently, really until the U.S. election. Um, the, the, the tech companies think of themselves as, I mean, literally as platforms and they're not really responsible and they sort of actively didn't care about the political implications of what they were doing and didn't want to know about it because that would have been a problem. Um, I think the U.S. election has forced at least the very biggest ones to think twice about this. And there's a lot of conversation now about technological solutions, some of which I think is going to peter off and not work, and some of which may, may, may come to something. Um, lots and lots and lots of people are looking at um, sort of automated fact-checking. You know, can you use artificial intelligence to find either false narratives or um, can you identify, I think Google, one of, a department of Google has, is trying to work on a program that can identify hostile language, is there some way of, 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 of trying to understand, you know, for example, to help people who are monitoring comments forums to eliminate um, bad actors. Um, there are a lot of, lots of, I mean, my fear about some of these things is that they will sound great on paper and they won't work in practice. I mean, you can imagine how if you had an AI program that was designed to find hostile language, people would immediately figure out what that algorithm was and find a way around it. Um, there is a lot of conversation about, you know, can algorithms be changed so that, so as to favor true stories over fake ones. And of course, then we get immediately into the question of what's true and what's fake and who decides. Um, and that makes um, all of these companies incredibly uncomfortable. Um, you're, the, the, the bot problem, I think, is connected to something else, which is the question of anonymity. Um, something like half of the people on Twitter are fake. Um, and uh, we all know how this works. I mean, there are huge sort of teams of bots that are organized to do various things and to tweet automatically and so on. I mean, sooner or later, um, Twitter may be forced either by pressure or by, by economic pressure to look twice at this. But right now, um, it is, you know, it's in, tw I mean, Twitter could end an anonymity tomorrow if it wanted to. Um, simply by requiring people to provide more information when they sign up to have a Twitter feed, which actually Facebook does a little bit more than Twitter does. Um, and of course, they don't do it because then they would lose half their followers. I mean, half their, half their users. 
Um, so thinking about campaigns or ways to pressure Twitter and others to end anonymity would get rid of the problem really actually quite fast. Um, and that's a lot easier than coming up with, you know, I don't know, counterbot warfare strategy tactics. Um, one of the, you know, there are beginning to be, it's almost like you have to think of it like a um, insurgency campaign. Um, one of the things that was very interesting that was done by the Macron campaign during the French election, which you, you may know about, was that they, and this is, a, this is a slightly different topic, this is in bots, this is how you respond to the knowledge that you're being hacked. Um, they knew they were being hacked. They were aware that people were trying to get access to their campaign database. Um, and so what they did was very interesting, which is that they put out tons and tons of fake information. They fed the hackers genuinely fake stories and sort of obviously fake stories. So, you know, completely ludicrous, you know, documents that couldn't possibly be real. And they fed all this stuff to the hackers, which confused the hackers who were then left with this huge trove of information, some of which was clearly fake, um, and left and made it much more difficult for them to figure out how to use it and manipulate it. So, you know, one of the things that may happen is that people begin to think about, think harder about what are the correct responses to being hacked, what are the correct responses to knowing you, your, 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 your information is being manipulated. So those are a few, those are a few answers. The only thing I'd like to add to that is uh, the only way you will actually interest IT companies and technological companies to address this issue uh, is when you convince uh, them and others that fake news, disinformation, hacking is not just another point of view, it's not just another way of looking at a story. This is clearly uh, uh, using illegal means to attain an illegal uh, uh, goal. You can, you can also convince them, I should say, one of the things that does worry them, they're worried about kind of the pollution of the internet. So if people begin to see, oh, Facebook is just full of garbage, I'm not going to read it anymore, then that begins to be a problem for Facebook. And I think Google feels the same way. So it's, you know, the, uh, convincing them that this is a problem is, is get, we're getting closer to that. Correct. There is a, an interesting element of your question, whether, whether we can use good bots to fight the bad bots. But, uh, you know, I see that basically bad people, they are, uh, it's a famous phrase, they are playing with the rules while, while we are playing by the rules. And in that framework, we will always lose. If we also play with the rules, I'm not sure that we want to live in this world because where is the red line? Uh, what is the, you know, uh, when it becomes sensitive and counter, uh, counteracting. So my approach is that we have to bring up new rules. And by understanding that it's not just about, once again, journalism and information. This is a new realm of international relationship. This is the new dimension of social, um, you know, behavior, social cohabitation, so to say. And without the uh, answering of how do we see these rules, it is impossible to counteract this big challenge. And you're right, we have to put, and the, the, the outcome of this kind of question is that we have to put tech companies uh, at this table because without them, they are the stakeholders, and without them, we are not able to answer that question. And one more important thing, that uh, companies, you know, their decisions are very often are made by, by money. This is uh, the, one of the most important factors. And uh, I think it's up to politicians to say, hey, actually, here is the regulation, and we're going to regulate that, uh, in particular things about bots and you know, personalization, uh, or so on and so forth, when they will feel that probably they will lose money, that they ha have nowhere to go, because it's, this is what will save us in the end. And I don't know if we need... Uh, new rules, I think we need to finesse the rules because the last time I checked, lying, misleading, those are all acts that, that are reprehensible. And if you and, and, convince... And illegal. And, uh, sorry. I mean, libel is legal. You know, so applying yes. libel yeah, exactly. laws to the internet, you know, that falls, helps solve the problem. Exactly. And, and, and when you tell the, either the tech companies or those forums that facilitate that they become accomplices of right. illegal acts, that's when you start getting them to think or to rethink their strategy.
And then there's also the question of, of what do you do about the people inside, the citizens of these countries who are helping to amplify it all. I mean, it's it's always really shocking to me when I see, you know, members of the alt-right, for example, in the U.S. kind of uh, echoing the, the Russian propaganda that's being put out. So... So how do you how do you feel that that we can you know work against that? I mean, it's it's obviously not just the companies that bear the responsibility. It's also the people who well, the companies bear the responsibility when when you know for for libel you know for for action and exactly. kinds of speech that break existing laws. I mean, I'm actually kind of ag I'm against creating lots of new regulation because first of all it will be controversial and difficult to enforce. But if we can begin to find ways to enforce existing law, exactly. I mean, this is by the way. You know your point about corruption earlier and, and Western tolerance of Russian corruption is is a similar point. I mean, we don't need new rules. We need to enforce the ones that exist. Um, you know, we have actually a, a, a long body of a long you know history of societal discussion, both of corruption and of um, what kinds of speech are problematic. And all we just need to do is figure out how to apply it to the internet. Are there other questions? Yeah, just one. I come from Lithuania and uh, I work in the media organization and we face quite a lot of fake news uh, there coming from Russia mostly. Um, and um, we also try to combat them by ourselves. We have a tool, we have a platform I work with, we received Google funding for that one as well. There are volunteers who do that, so that by themselves, they call themselves elves, so it's sort of mythology thing involved there. And however, it seemed for me that Anne Applebaum just mentioned uh, a bit of an elephant in the room, that everyone seems to be forgetting uh, the Macron case. Why did Macron mention RT and Sputnik? Because they, not bots, not unnamed bots, but people behind the Russian information campaign, whether it's Kremlin sort of a, uh, Kremlin agents or the, the, uh, those are journalists, whatever you call them, they created those fake news stories. So the question basically is, how do you deal with them? Do you still call them journalists because they present themselves and they come to the conferences, they come to the meetings and they say, we're journalists, we have full right. And they ask questions and then they make stories, they twist the facts, they basically create those fake stories. What do you do with them? In our country, we have several responses. Sometimes journalists are not let into the country. In Ukraine, I know, same case. But in the West, now we have Macron case, do you think that will spread in any way? Is it possible at all that, you know, people will scream there's a freedom of speech, freedom of press, and so on? So there's a bit of a clash there. What do you think about that? I, first of all, I'd say this, that I call a spade a spade, and I think that those that are doing what you described uh, are not journalists. Uh, those are agents of disinformation, agents of libel, and I think they need to be exposed as such and addressed as such. And you cannot apply the same rules to those that are violating the rules by which we govern ourselves uh, uh, and, the rest of the, uh, and the rest of the world. And I think that also in the case of Lithuania and other countries, we need to recognize that this is a global problem and we need to address it globally. And I think that there are various, uh, in various countries, there are uh, people who are fighting it effectively. Uh, Stop Fake in Ukraine is, is a case in point, and I think that uh, bodies such as Stop Fake and others need to work uh, together in order to, to, uh, to fight, expose uh, uh, agents of disinformation and to address them properly. I see here a problem is that they use our freedom of speech as a value, as an instrument to basically target our freedom of speech, you know? And the problem is that it is impossible to uh, destruct their instrument without hitting our own value. Because it's like a, a cancer that lives in a, in, a, in a good cell that you don't want to destroy. And that's, uh, for me, it's a question with an open end. In Ukraine, uh, our our government did a number of the very controversial steps. For example, recently, president issued a decree and he banned social networks that have been used by 18 million of Ukrainians. It was Russian social networks like Odnoklasniki, Vkontakte, who knows them. And uh, I, for example, share the aim to decrease the influence of those social networks in Ukrainian information sphere uh, because they are very powerful, they are 
it's uh, impossible to counteract them. But at the same time, I see that there is a, a very big risk that it can justify censorship, that it can justify a very easy ban of anything that would be described as a propaganda and that can, for example, be critical towards the current government. So, to be honest, I don't know the, question, the, the answer uh, to that question. That's why I believe that uh, we have to work together with a number of different stakeholders. Uh, on the grassroots le level, we were able to develop some really good uh, instruments like Stop Fake, we have this initiative, what they do, they investigate these kind of cases and they show them and it's really important. But in the end, when there is a fake news, it can be sh seen by millions of people and Stop Fake investigation are basically consumed by maybe, uh, I don't know, tens of thousands. So it's not the same scale. Uh, so the, the, the question is open one. I think one of the important tools that we haven't used effectively is reciprocity. So, okay, you know, RT and Sputnik want to um, broadcast here. Well, why why don't ra why aren't Radio for Europe and um, Voice of America and Deutsche Welle <coughs> and Radio France International why aren't they being allowed to broadcast in Russian in Russia um, and demanding? You know, if, okay, if you don't let us broadcast there, if you don't let us use FM radio stations, which they don't, um, then you can't operate as journalists here. I think that would be, um, mm -hmm. that, that would be at least reasonable. Do we have time for one more? Okay. <clears throat> hey, uh, I have a question about mainstream news. Because you said that financial constraints often lead this media to sensational, uh, sensationalism. Uh, which somehow amplifies the, the, the messages um, that are thrown in sometimes by, deliberately by, by foreign governments. So my question is, for example, how do you do, uh, how do you deal with those people who use not, not necessarily fake news but sometimes silly news uh, as a smoke screen? And here I have a, a concrete example in my mind, so obviously the, the latest uh, feud between President Trump and, and American media. Do you report on it? Do you, are you, should you report on it or should you just ignore it? Because this, this last one with Mika Brzezinski and uh, Joe Scarborough, suddenly after a couple of tweets by Trump, nobody seems to remember that he just failed to pass the healthcare law uh, and nobody seems to remember the details uh, of, of, of that law and, and the, the whole political discussion around it. So how do you behave uh, against uh, this kind of manipulation? Because people say that uh, Trump doesn't need mainstream news because he kind of stepped out of this environment and he communicates directly with his uh, followers on Twitter. I, I beg to disagree. I think that he needs both. He uses the mainstream news to amplify his messages that he puts on Twitter. He has only like 30 million followers comparing to Obama. It's, it's less than half. So how would you behave in, in light of this kind of politician? Uh, it's not fake news literally, but it's, it's not news either, is it? That's a good question. Does anyone want to? Anne, do you want to take it away? Um, uh, first of all, apparently something like half of Trump's followers on Twitter are also fake. So you're, um, you're, <coughs> you're, you're completely right that his use of Twitter, um, the idea that it's somehow direct communication is ridiculous. It only succeeds to the extent that it and reaches people because the mainstream media repeats it. So people usually hear about, you know, my parents have never used Twitter and don't know anything about it, but they knew all about this Mika Brzezinski attack because it was reported on CNN. So you're exactly right that that's, that's the way it's done. I mean, uh, you know, one might take the example of the French media, which um, during the election campaign really quite, um, you know, decided not to report on at least a part of the fake stories and at least a part of the, <coughs> the hysteria. But, you know, but that requires, and I think actually, I, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that in Lithuania there's also a kind of, you know, national agreement, journalists work together, um, you know, to, 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 you know, to prevent this kind of trash reporting on stupid stories. Um, that's easier to achieve in, in countries that have some kind of, um, I don't know, that have some kind where media are mostly gathered around the center, countries like France and Germany, much harder to achieve here or in the United States um, in countries that are very divided. Um, I don't have a direct answer to it, except that the answer might fall into the category of media literacy. 
So teaching people how to read better, um, you know, what's a junk story, what's a real story, what's something that really affects your life, like healthcare, as opposed to something that's, you know, marginally amusing, like Trump's Twitter feed, and, and, and helping people begin to distinguish between those two. And I'll just add, I mean, as, as a reporter covering Trump day in and day out, I mean, it's, it's always a judgment call. Um, there are certain things that he tweets that we do ignore. Um, we kind of take it on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but in the end, he is the president of the United States, and he's using this platform to reach millions of people. And so when he says something on Twitter, I mean, his own, his own press secretary, his own advisors have said in the past, those are presidential statements. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a balance, um, but I, I, I think it would be a slippery slope to ignore them entirely. I think that you asked a delicate question, and uh, uh, junk news uh, needs to be addressed by each uh, mainstream channel uh, that decides whether to use it or not. Uh, what I was saying about disinformation and fake news and uh, agents of disinformation, that's where you cross the line. And that's where uh, mainstream uh, uh, media and any, but any, any other form of media should be accountable for being either an accomplice to an illegal act or not. Any one of you guys? Um, who has the mic? Hi. Um, for, for all the eloquent things you've said about Russian disinformation, there are... Uh, a depressingly large amount of people that even if they um, believe you, they will say, well, okay, fine, but so does the West. Does all the same things you've just accused Russia of doing. Um, and uh, that really cuts through. That transcends uh, p political ideologies too. You find it on the, on the far left, on the right. Um, so how do you counter those that will see the malevolent influence of the West in everything? Um, how do you prove it, you know, and they might even have, you never know, concrete examples of such situations. But um, how do you prove the absence of something? How do you get through to those people? Can you? That's a good question. Can you actually ver verify what, what uh, can you give an example of how does West do the same? Because I want to understand how, how you see it. He, he's, not, uh, he's, 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 oh, okay. he's, he's not saying that he sees it. Okay. He's saying that people say that. The what about it? Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm talking too much. But <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the best, th I mean, it depends how long a conversation you want to have with, you know, these other people. But um, no, I think it's worth actually going through what is meant by influence, what is meant by disinformation, what it is that the West actually does who the West supports in dictatorships and in, in, you know, in, inside Russia or inside. And you know, fundamentally, at the end of the day, it's about you know, what you think. I mean, it is a fundamental question because it's about what you think the West stands for as opposed to what Russia stands for. And do you believe that, you know, the, the, I mean, if you believe that the goal, if we understand, as I've just described, you know, the goal of the Russian regime is to keep a, you know, a kleptocratic uh, elite in power, um, is there, um, is there anything different about the West? So does the West all seek um, different kinds of regimes in other countries? What, what kinds of, I mean, regime is the wrong word. Um, what kinds of values is it supposed to be standing for? Or even not the West as a whole, what kind of values are being supported when organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy or the Atlantic Council reach out to groups in, in other countries? Um, and you have to look at the, you know, you have to look at the, differences between those kinds of activities and explain them. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's the only thing you can do. I mean, it's true that you, there are a, there are political factions in the West on both the far left and the far right, which think the West is evil. And so then you're dealing with a different kind of conversation. You have to convince them that it isn't. Um, and because the West is evil, therefore they can align with, I don't know, ISIS or Russia or Hezbollah or whichever, whichever crazy group it is. Um, and then, you know, then we're into a conversation about extremist politics and why people believe extremist things, um, which isn't really a conversation that we can solve right now at this second. Um, but, if, you know, I think it's worth usually pursuing the argument to its end. You know, what do you mean? What are you, are you comparing like with like? And, and what do you think the consequences are? <laughs>
And against the argument of equivalence that both sides are equally bad, I think that the, probably the most effective way to deal with it is track record. And when you start exposing it in an effective way that uh, various certain medium are uh, consistently misleading the population, then you will have those that will believe because they have an agenda, they'll believe them. You'll have the useful idiots that you will not, unless you really have nothing to do and you have a lot of time to spend trying to convince an individual that black is white. But uh, mostly, uh, I think that the general uh, population, uh, the, the most effective way, for, from, at least from my perspective, to convince them uh, on which side uh, uh, is the closest to the truth is on the basis of track record. And that's why it's important to expose disinformation in an effective and convincing way and to address it globally. I think we have to wrap it up there. But thank you all so much for being here and sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you very much.